Hey everybody, so today we are in for a treat. We are going to be doing an interview with Fatima Brown, who is with Reclassify AI, which I came across them quite recently, but oh my goodness, can I say how amazing the company is, what they're doing. This is not sponsored. I just really think that they're doing something really amazing. And so I wanted to talk to Fatima about what are some of those opportunities that she sees for bringing the human back into our artificial intelligence and machine learning exercises. So if this sounds interesting to you, keep on watching. Hi. Well, first of all, Ashley, thank you so much for having me on your platform. Um, so I am actually uh, the founder of a, a cool startup called Classify AI. And what we do is we focus on um, what we call human-powered AI approaches, right? So what we help organizations do is piece all of your data together and apply a semantic framework um, and link their data so that way that data can then be used um, for machine learning applications. So it's, we're, we're an end-to-end -end, um, solution. It's, it, we, we help organizations from the inception that includes um, building the business case, defining it, and documenting it, and presenting it, if that mm -hmm. need be, um, through to design and delivery. So that's the design um, of the, the semantic frameworks, mm -hmm. uh, the knowledge graphs, graph systems. We have expertise in the, the entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, we can advise on, you know, property graph versus an RDF graph, et cetera. Um, we were fully engaged in and super nerdy and excited to have that conversation all of the time, yeah. um, as well as um, the, the performing the actual linking of mm -hmm. the data, um, what that means within the client ecosystem and, and all of the interoperability challenges around, you know, pulling in. Um, a, variety, a full slate or a variety of yep. um, in-house and external vendor tools um, mm -hmm. to help uh, leveraging um, the data, the, the newly linked integrated data for machine learning operations. So we help with that entire workflow end to end. But we, we, we don't come in and in, in sort of with an attitude of like, you know, you have to follow this workflow. <laughs> we come in and we, we want to know what your needs are and we, we can be pretty mercenary about it. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. Some of our, our clients, um, they have um, they have a knowledge graph. They they've done some experimenting with maybe a variety of, of or, or a few knowledge graph types. Mm -hmm. um, they have machine learning expertise in house, but they don't have ontologists, right? Mm -hmm. They don't have knowledge architects. So we can supply that, right? We can supply mm -hmm. both the strategic vision for a knowledge architecture or some um, scalable semantic framework, or you know, hands-on ontologists that we need to just you know just get your, your ontology like up and running. Okay. All right, so Fatima, one thing that you mentioned is, you know, human powered. What does that mean? Yeah, um, so put simply, um, AI is based on models. Um, and models are either encoded with bias or they learn bias that exists in the world um, and the data that we use. Um, and that makes it really difficult to create AI that learns or performs without reflecting the errors and the assumptions of its creators, and um, or simply reflects the errors of bias that exist in the world. And we see various scenarios in which AI models have failed us um, because we left humans out of the loop, right? Mm -hmm. And or because we failed to recognize um, the extent to which the initial models might have been encoded with some mm -hmm. bias. Mm -hmm. And I think key examples might be, you know, um, some of these advanced. Um, human resource systems, right, where they might have some bias, some selection bias towards mm -hmm. what a model of, um, of a traditional employee might look like. Uh, GPT-3 systems mm -hmm. and, and those large language models are another exa a, a mm -hmm. good example um, that fail to be able to respond, um, uh, systems that, that fail to respond to like really simple questions that humans do a really great job of responding to. Um, and then I think in terms of um, uh, really kind of sinister things that can happen, Microsoft's Tay, uh, which can be commissioned, but one of the, the, the challenges that, that presented itself with Microsoft's Tay was that that bot kind of learned some of the worst parts of, of human right. experience and value. Yep. yep. Yeah, and, and I think what you're highlighting is something that I, and this is why I re originally uh, reached out to you because I, I read up on on your startup website, which is a fabulous website, very informative. Uh, 
is the the importance of of these ethics in AI. And you hear a lot of people talking about this, but not a lot of people kind of going into, yeah, but how do we fix it? How do we how do we make sure that that doesn't you know become you know, a widespread or a wider spread uh, problem. You know, machines are as smart and as biased as the people, you know, and and their awareness of those people going into it. So I, I truly believe in some of the stuff that, that you're really talking about here. So how are you and your company actually going about, you know, getting around or um, addressing these issues? So we're doing a few things, right, to address some of these challenges. So there's a combination of um, there's an education component and uh, and letting and and not just you know from for, for our parents, but also for, for folks who are very technical, right, and giving them more insight into um, into some of the problem space and then some of the proposed solutions like a semantic space solution or um, and how they can leverage knowledge graphs. Um, so educating folks on some of the big misconceptions. Is um, so one is you know people believe that AI will soon replace human beings, right? And we all know that we're nowhere close to making that. <laughs> I know I laugh so hard at that stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. So, um, so big problem in in this space is is that in addition to that is people assume that okay, well we we get that there are these problems, let's just throw like tons of data. Um, and eventually, statistics will solve it all. Um, and I think a lot of that is, and that a lot of that is a hangover from um, the, the big data era, the big data approach, um, which I was a part of. <laughs> I don't know if I, Ashley, you, you might know. I, so, yep. uh, Throw enough data at it, it'll fix itself, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, and I think what we're coming to now, like through that 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 uh, uh, trial and error and education is um, the realization that what we really need is more cure, well curated data um, mm -hmm. and car carefully constructed models that allow us to assemble and exploit our data effectively, right? So it's identifying some of the problems and the opportunities. And then now we're in the, the, the worldview of like, what do we do to create um, data that's um, increased the quality, mm -hmm. that's more trustworthy, that's um, reusable or frameworks that are reusable for a variety of applications. The, the pain points that were the themes that we're seeing across industries as well. Well, let's let's just touch on the last the last point that you made, right? The mm -hmm. the conversation around bias mitigation. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a few key things that I mean, and, and it's a very timely conversation because I think more attention is being is being paid to that mm -hmm. that topic. Um, so in terms of, of bias, right, that's bias in both the data and the people. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that starts with understanding where, where the bias has uh, entry points. Mm -hmm. And from a classified perspective, we, we believe in um, the approach, the, the right approach to mitigating bias is to, you know, kind of deal with it further upstream. When you're thinking about the problem space, right? So what mm -hmm. are the that, are, that, that folks are identifying as being worthy of solving for? Mm -hmm. um, and then once you identify those, then you go into um, solution design and implementation. But really it starts, it starts at the beginning. You know, what, what's worthy for being solved for and how do we go about solving it? And from a reclassified perspective, because we believe in that human-powered, semantics-based approach, we want to bring um, in, an interdisciplinary team of folks together to think about the problem space and then to think creatively about approaches to solving for those for some of those challenges. You know, you were talking um, briefly about you know HR. Uh, systems and I know there are some systems that you can even use based on LinkedIn data based on this is the person's profile and they did get that position or they did not get that position and, and actually using machine learning models to learn what is the ideal candidate and it's like well, whoa 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 wait a minute there's historical data there that we all know like for example women in technology we we are only now making a, a break into that a little bit um, so if you use historical data, you're going to be missing a big demographic. So, you know, if you're not aware of these things, you're not going to know to even really pay attention and, and look for them. It goes back to just having the conversation. And I think a lot of folks don't have that biased conversation at the onset. Mm -hmm. And I think if you go into an initiative, um, be mindful and constantly, you know, being good stewards 
about protecting the integrity of the initiative, then you go into trying to do your best along the way of mitigating bias at every step. And, and that's really, you know, I mean, it's, it's an evolution, right? Because we're, we're really starting um, um, forward thinking about this bias conversation. So we're going to start seeing a lot of those approaches like evolve, evolve right? So I think that's, that's certainly an approach that works. And we'll start to refine that a little bit more. Um, as we as we all learn and grow together and, and and that's why and I just want to double down on this from a classified perspective that's why it's so important to have interdisciplinary teams so you know I came into this space via a social scientist background right like when you're a social scientist you're kind of thinking about the impact of things you're thinking about um, you know in, uh, how you're designing um, various uh, initiatives um, and how they impact human beings, right? And then we're also leveraging the expertise of psychologists. Mm -hmm. um, so bringing in together the social scientists with the computational sciences and biological sciences um, mm -hmm. has been um, something that, an approach that's worked really well for us. And I've also recently I've stumbled upon um, more of the um, uh, uh, academic focus areas called mm -hmm. um, computational social scientists. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So just yeah. that, that folks are realizing these things work better together. Yeah, of, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think what, something else that, that you touch on with this, you know, human focus is at the end of the day, the models could give you some really cool information, but if it's not consumable or relatable to humans, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Absolutely. So we, we, we really drive home the point, or we attempt to at least, of the power of a semantics-based approach, right? Like contextualizing your data and building frameworks that allow you to kind of extend what well, from an organizational standpoint, um, you know, where you have a lot of different folks kind of working on these models, you need, you need language models or semantic models that are extensible, um, that folks can kind of like leverage for um, at enterprise use, but also for kind of unit use or di uh, departmental use, right? Mm -hmm. From a reclassified perspective, um, we, we certainly, you know, believe in the power of semantics, um, but we we believe that there's, there's a, a, a great kind of relationship or balance that happens when you bring semantics together with the statistical model mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we've witnessed, we've actually delivered some pretty um, impressive results. And I think that conversation is starting to crop up more. So, so the, uh, the, the other um, theme in terms of um, areas of opportunities in the data space is the, and we touched on this lightly, but the proliferation of cottage industries that, mm -hmm. that um, in, within a single organization um, creating like, uh, like an, or, uh, uh, an organization or data gridlock, uh, if you will. Yep. Um, and we and we all know what exists, right? When we're, when we're talking with our colleagues, we all know that this is a problem. There's lots of data that supports that, that this is a, a real opportunity where a lot of organizations do pretty poorly on. Um, but I'm glad that we're seeing uh, a revisiting or a lot of attention being paid to recently um, on how to do a better job of making use of the data that we have access to and that mm -hmm. we own. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a core part of what reclassifies frameworks um, are, uh, mm -hmm. are doing. Um, so what we do is we we help clients identify where the, where the data lies within your organization. Yeah. Uh, data governance frameworks. I mean, yep. we talk a lot about like being good stewards of projects, but being like data stewards as well. Like, yeah. Yeah. A culture around um, a good data management, like what that actually looks like, in a pragmatic way, um, mm -hmm. a way that tries to, you know, immediately or overnight transform an organization. Yeah. Because we all know if you work for large organizations, that takes forever, and it also is uh, there's a, a human cost to that type of change. That that yeah, that hearts and minds are not won easily or quickly. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. That's exactly yeah. it. Right. Um, yeah. So we, we help them, uh, uh, you know, identify their, where their data lies bring that data together, it, um, integrate it um, from an operational, but also a systems perspective. Um, and it, and we help them leverage it outright for machine learning. It's like the buy-in is there and they're like, but it's magic. It will fix everything, the data, don't worry about the data. Machine learning will figure that out. Oh my goodness, I, I have a video. I will link it down below if anyone is interested. One of the main problems with doing machine learning is 
do you have the data to feed the model? Yeah. And very often the answer is no, or it's super dirty, or it's in 20 different places. So having someone like yourself be that kind of like data therapist in that aspect is so important because a lot of companies do not know how to translate the business need to the teams doing the machine learning. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. A lot of the time that I spend is, is on that, that therapy piece, yeah. right? And it's, it's the, ther I mean, I guess that's where the consulting comes in, like those skills, um, but it's, it's helping folks understand the opportunity um, and helping them articulate that back out to the business, right? And, and that's really the kind of the relationship that ends up happening between the business side and the technical side within organizations. Um, so to extend that 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 point, you know, one of the other levels of, of uh, complication that ends up surfacing is what do you do once once you know what is that what happens at the end, right? So you're you're a machine learning you're a machine learning engineer or data scientist, etc. You've leveraged some data. Where does that data go, right? Like what does that what does that workflow look like for once once data? has been, um, once it's been transformed, once it's been leveraged in another um, environment or for an application, what is the reusability of that yeah. look like? Like how do you create shortcuts um, across your organization so that way other folks who are doing machine learning um, or just data analytics in general are trying to derive some value out of your data, how can they leverage that um, yeah. without having to uh, start over? <laughs> Being in, in the midst of, of working with organizations that are trying to undertake uh, digital transformation efforts, we're seeing things like fragile and brittle systems, mm -hmm. um, which is related to the, the popular kind of um, narrow AI conversation that's, yeah. that's coming up now, right? Um, yeah. Particularly when people think about the repurposing of IBM Watson. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so just for some of the audience, the way that I kind of see that challenge is or that opportunity is where um, a particular tool might perform extremely well in one context um, or use case, but then performance um, might decline significantly or the tool breaks entirely. Hence with the brittleness. It. Yeah, that's the brittleness. Mm -hmm. um, and that's and, and, and that tends to happen when, when you're extending the use of that tool to a different use case. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right. So, yep. uh, so at Reclassify, we've been facilitating this conversation, and, mm -hmm. and that's where we, we, we rope in the semantics-based approach to help create systems that are a little bit more flexible um, yep. and that set, set you up for reusable data. Because that's, a lot of that comes down to, in addition to having like the expertise to master um, this kind of interdisciplinary approach, it really comes down to being good stewards around an initiative, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there's, when you're, I think part of also what happened with Watson was, um, you know, and, and we all face this as folks who work in industry, is trying to strike the balance between delivering for business versus delivering for marketing. <laughs> oh, yes. And, and I think, you know, with Knowledge Graph, where it's been tested, well, Knowledge Graph has been around for a long time, so it has like this, this long this streak of success. I think right now it's like, well, how do we leverage, harness all of that interest um, and, 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 and really highlight and crystallize all of the, the real value for mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, And so that's, that's a huge part of what we're doing at Reclassify as well. So it, it, it is this story um, over the years that I've seen of organizations saying, okay, hey, we, we believe in this. We need to kind of prove it out a little bit with mm -hmm. our, our business folks, our business stakeholders, um, but then they may or may not throw resources and budget at it, right? So I think, you know, from a reclassified perspective, when we're meeting with potential clients um, and we're having that initial engagement conversation, we really want to understand what your business mandate is. Mm -hmm. if, if you have a strong business buy-in, not necessarily for the end result, because people, it's really hard for folks to see the, 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 the product roadmap, like that. Oh, way. yeah. But even if you have, even if your organization is curious enough to put some spe um, specific KPIs around what they are looking to see, even in the short at the short in the short term, um, that's very helpful. But also organizations, they they may not even be there. They may not have had the conversation internally to where they've got they've gained that business yeah. audience to produce KPIs, 
And so they need an external group like a reclassified cup to come in and help them build that business case. Um, yeah. You might have some folks who are knowledge about engineers and they know it, but they need to sell it, right? And yeah. they haven't exactly sold it to uh, to the folks holding the purse within their organizations. So we help them with that as well, right? I mean, all of these different things. And we've had we've had some challenges where you know, especially if you're working in financial services or other industries that are highly regulated, and, mm-hmm. and where how data flows can be incredibly complex. Mm-hmm. Um, so we help mm-hmm. them manage through that, right? Because like my my background um, in in uh, the semantic AI approach stems from the uh, financial services sector. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the folks who work for me, we are across financial services, healthcare, and government. So we have we have expertise across the board. Mm-hmm. And that helps us think about what the right approach is um, for whether it's on-prem, yeah. uh, what what components and flows kind of happen on-prem versus off-prem in, in those mm-hmm. conversations. Wow. And and you know, having been um, on the other side of the coin so many times where I'm interviewing vendors, I'm interviewing consultancies and saying, OK, you know, uh, how are we how would you go about doing this? How can you help us? Uh, most of the time, people have like this very general kind of bucketing um, way that they talk about it. But you just went to the detail and you you really understood like, OK, these are the common questions that people have to ask themselves and that you can help them understand these are the questions you need to have answers for. Um, and I think that that is, is a really strong uh, statement, but you combine must have a lot of experience because that is a, a true mature statement in, in this space um, that I, I don't hear from everybody else that, <laughs> that's doing this sort of thing. Well, well, thank you. I certainly appreciate that. And just from my from my my professional experience, I've had the fortune of being um, both in house and as a consultant. So I've been able to see these things from from across the board. And I think that's that's helped frame and mature my viewpoint. Um, and then you know the folks on my team also are extremely experienced folks um, uh, from a business and technical standpoint. Yeah, and and that is is the the happy special sauce. Um, there's a lot of folks that will go too much onto what I call the data therapist side, where it's like, okay, sit down, tell me your problems. How does this data make you feel? Right? And there's there's a there's definitely a place for that. Don't get me wrong, but that's where they stop. And then it's kind of like they give you your report card, your health assessment on your status, and that's it. And again, sometimes that's all people need, but in many other cases people feel like, okay, now what do I do with this? How do I make it a reality? And it sounds like you folks are doing that. And what I'm also hearing is you help train and get them up on their own feet so they can keep going with it, which is so incredibly important. It's it's the whole pushing the baby bird out of the nest moment. Absolutely. Absolutely, Ashley. Um, so it's all of that. And we we have a, a particular like, viewpoint about different things, right? Like we we you know I have some personal philosophies about things that work and versus that don't work. But it, when it comes to how we do business, we're not um, sort of doctrinaire about how we solve business problems. Um, so we we don't and we don't think that a knowledge graph um, solution. We don't think that we don't see knowledge graphs as being like a hammer and that everything is a nail, mm-hmm. right? Um, mm-hmm. Although we, we like to stress the importance of, and the value of using knowledge graphs um, yep. as part and parcel of a full scale um, data analytic environment. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, we think our role is to be good stewards, to, to yep. leverage our expertise as both the in-house yep. uh, technical folks and uh, consultants to mm-hmm. advise and as well as deliver and mm-hmm. educate so that way we're leaving some knowledge behind. Yeah. Um, and that's and what you're seeing actually is such a, an important point because what we're hearing a lot of the time, especially recently, is folks don't want lifelong consulting partners. Exactly, exactly. We really love this space. Like we, we we're constantly learning on our own. We're constantly having internal conversations, mm-hmm. and we're trying to be you know forward thinking and be part of the folks who are driving the conversation mm-hmm. and we want to bring other folks along to to have fun with us, right? Like to learn yeah. with us. Um, and that includes educating folks within our client space 
on how they can, um, you know, advance their skills in intelligent development, you know, leveraging, you know, diving into the deep, uh, the depths of uh, WC3 standards, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then also thinking about, um, you know, how to advance some of those those frameworks as well. Yeah. So, yeah, you can tell that you don't just have a passion for the technology, you have a passion for the impact that it has. Because what you're saying is not only are you making sure that people can divorce from you, and it's, you know, a, you know, amicable between the two, right? <laughs> you're, you're helping them nurture. Uh, but you're you're also giving back. You're you're taking those learnings and you're saying, look, we all have to figure this out. We all got to get our act together on this. And you're taking those learnings and, and pushing back. And, you know, on on the um, smart business side, right? Like, you know, you're also helping shape the standards that, you know, the way that you see them, which is also super helpful, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, um, Fatima, I mean, I'm all bought in. Like, I, <laughs> I, I love just like your your presence on this stuff. I love your messaging on this stuff. I'm very excited um, to have you on the channel. And if anyone is interested in finding out more about you and the company and all the great stuff that you've been talking about, how would they go about doing that? Uh, simple. Uh, visit our website www.reclassify.ai. That's R-E-C-L-A-S-S-I-F-Y.ai.